their team. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, and I'm going to be your moderator for our talk tonight, which is presented by the University of Miami Health System Cardiovascular Department. You Health's cardiovascular experts are pioneers, offering the most advanced, innovative cardiovascular care available. From heart mapping and stroke prevention, high-tech imaging, minimally invasive transcatheter aortic valve replacement, to our heart failure innovation and treatment program, they're leading the way and saving lives. As an academic-based cardiac and vascular program, they offer patients a multidisciplinary approach to clinical innovation and problem solving. Their experts work collaboratively from cardiac and thoracic surgery, vascular surgery, endocrinology, oncology, radiology, and neurology. So we invite you to learn more about U Health's cardiovascular care by visiting uhealthcv.com and contact them to schedule a consult and screening as well and call 305-243-5554. We're going to have more on that information so that you can have it throughout uh, this evening. And so many of you are joining us this evening. So we're, we're so pleased that you're going to hear from our cardiovascular experts, Dr. Oranger, Dr. Grisette, Dr. Alfonso, and Dr. Hadizizis, who will explore the following topics, heart disease prevention in 2023, finding success in heart failure and current treatments, evolution of therapies for valvular heart disease and catheter-based treatment of coronary disease, and the difference our academic-based cardiovascular program can make for patients like you. And we want you to know that at the end of the evening's presentation, you'll have plenty of opportunity for a Q&A session for our experts to answer your questions. So please enter your questions as you think of them and you use the anonymous Q&A feature, locate it now at the bottom of your Zoom screen so you know where it is and we'll prepare them for our experts at the end of the presentation. So now let's get going with our program. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Carl Oranger, a professor of clinical medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and director of the Preventive Cardiovascular Medicine Program for UHealth. We welcome you, Dr. Oranger. You can start with your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Juliana. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a real pleasure to be sharing this uh, evening with my colleagues whose work I respect so much. And uh, tonight, we're going to be uh, starting off with a discussion of preventive cardiology. This is the area that I direct at the University of Miami Hospital. And all of us are really focused on ways that we can prevent cardiovascular disease. The man in the middle of this slide is suffering an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. And we know that those problems are most often caused by high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol. And often this occurs in the setting of a family history of early heart disease. So we look very hard at those factors in people who are, are coming in with a heart attack. But the problem that we really worry about is when people um, have significant heart damage and end up with heart failure, the shortness of breath upon walking very short distances, they develop heart rhythm disturbances, uh, or they sometimes develop a major blockage in an artery that requires uh, intervention and in opening the artery to try to minimize the damage that occurs to the heart. Now, when we think about prevention, we traditionally think of, of dietary changes, healthy foods that can reduce cardiovascular risk, fruits, vegetables, uh, whole grains, uh, low-fat dairy products, uh, low-fat uh, poultry without the skin, fish, uh, and, and a proper combination of those, minimizing the intake of uh, simple carbohydrates, pies, cakes, candies, cookies, fruit juices, alcohol, uh, white rice, white potatoes, white pasta. Those are all esteemed in the body as sugar and therefore increase cardiovascular risk. We're also talking about uh, forms of both aerobic exercise and musculoskeletal exercise, both of which can improve cardiovascular function and reduce risk. But we know that in many people, uh, both diet and lifestyle are, are inadequate to do that. And so sometimes we need to use cholesterol lowering medication or blood pressure medication or heart protective diabetes medicines. And in those who have established uh, arterial disease, history of heart attacks or strokes or lower leg uh, artery problems, aspirin is often useful to prevent recurrent events in those people. Now, many patients wanna try over-the-counter uh, non-prescription uh, remedies like garlic or over-the-counter fish oil, cinnamon, coenzyme Q10, red yeast, rice, lecithin or multivitamins, but none of those have been shown to have significant uh, LDL cholesterol lowering effects. 
and none of them have demonstrated evidence to reduce heart attack risk. Now, we are excited because in the next few months, we're going to be opening up the University of Miami Center for Preventive Cardiology. And we're going to be dealing there with uh, patients who have cholesterol triglyceride disorders, high blood pressure, diabetes mellitus, people who are overweight or obese who want to lose weight, people who have genetic disorders that are associated with increased risk, those who have multiple risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, uh, strong family histories of early heart disease, uh, or uh, those who have already had a heart attack or a stroke or have leg, uh, have reduced the flow to the legs in their arteries, and these people can greatly benefit by the services that we have to offer. And one of the great parts of this center is that we're gonna focus initially on lifestyle because the initial intake person will be a registered dietitian who will uh, provide dietary information and also assess things like dietary readiness. Are people ready to make changes in their diet and give them changes that are culturally sensitive, things that they will be able to accept in their daily lives to reduce their cardiovascular risk. The beauty is also we have multiple specialists. So it will, it will be, a, there will be a variety of cardiovascular and uh, other internal medicine specialists who deal with these problems in this center. Uh, we're going to make sure that the treatment for our patients is very personalized. We oftentimes get information that applies to populations, but the truth is that we want to provide treatment that is personalized to the individual who's coming in. There will be state-of-the-art diagnostic approaches used, and I'll talk about that in just a second. We're going to make sure that the recommendations that we're given are based on the evidence, not just on what one person thinks or who another person thinks, but we're very much focused on making sure that people get evidence-driven treatments. And finally, uh, we're going to have a, a great opportunity to provide uh, our patients with the newest advances in cardiovascular research. Now, you've probably heard a lot about artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is uh, and has certain subfields. There's deep learning, there's machine learning, but what these do is they make, uh, they make clinically useful uh, uh, decisions based on the input from large data sets. And so, for example, you can see here on the right, uh, this is a CT scan of a of a patient who, whose uh, heart has some deposits in the uh, calcium deposits in the arteries of the heart. And you'll notice that what the radiologist sees and what deep learning teaches us is almost identical. And the beauty of deep learning is that it can give us very rapid information, accurate information, and can help the radiologist to make proper interpretations of these scans. And uh, this is one example of a, of a research project that we have undertaken at the university where we identify the presence of coronary calcium on chest CT scans that were not even done to look for coronary calcium. And that's important because coronary calcium is a sign that there are cholesterol deposits in the walls of the arteries, putting people at increased risk for future heart attacks. So when people call into our center for prevention, they'll enter a call center, Intake is done by a registered dietitian nutritionist. And then there will be a nurse practitioner who will triage patients to the appropriate specialist, whether it's a cardiologist, a lipid specialist, a hypertension specialist, weight management specialist, or an endocrinologist. They'll get patients started on the right program to prevent cardiovascular disease. And then follow-up will be provided by a physician nurse practitioner team. So it's gonna be a great and efficient way for patients to get access to the care that they need to address their specific problem. And one of the great advantages of being in our healthcare system at the University of Miami is that we are the ones who actually get involved with, with both editing and writing studies that actually set the theme for what practitioners do. So we have people in our division who review articles for these uh, prestigious journals who are actually on the editorial boards of these journals so that they get to see the, the uh, latest studies even before they're published. And one of the advantages there is that they can provide for our patients the newest information and the information that is highly evidence-based. And then we also have practitioners in our group who collaborate on practice guidelines. So people who have written the cholesterol guidelines, for example, uh, in our group to, to enable our patients to know what is the evidence and how can we best give you treatments that are gonna prevent problems from occurring. So finally, I just wanna end by commenting on the differences that that you'll see when you come to the University of Miami rather than going to another uh, practice in, in this area. You're gonna have uh, practitioners with national and international reputations. You're gonna have access to experts who write treatment guidelines for prevention. 
There's going to be multi-specialty collaboration to facilitate high quality patient care. You're going to have access to cutting edge technology for early diagnosis that includes artificial intelligence. And you're going to have great access to research that advances patient care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Oranger. We have a lot to cover tonight, so we're going to keep this uh, moving. But we do remind the many of you who are joining us tonight in the audience to please enter your questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will present them to our presenters. Our next speaker is Dr. Luanda Grisette, who joined the University of Miami in 2020 as the Director of Advanced Heart Failure and Heart Failure Recovery and Therapeutic Innovation Program. Dr. Grisette launched and serves as Program Director for the Fellowship in Advanced Heart Failure and Transplantation, a program that was recognized as one of the most innovative training programs in the country. Welcome, Dr. Grisette. You're probably on mute. <laughs> Just unmute yourself with a little microphone. There yes, you are. There we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for that um, kind of rotation, a kind of um, um, introduction. And I'm going to get started by talking about what we do at the Center for Heart Failure Treatment and Recovery. And um, start. You'll want to share it with us in presentation, as you know. Mm -hmm. and we'll get that full screen soon. There we go. We don't quite see it yet. But uh, we've got time. And meanwhile, the audience is engaged in thinking of lots of questions, I'm sure. There, there we are. Go. Perfect. Okay, so apologies for that, but um, I think we'll go through this very quickly. Thank you for the introduction, Ileana, and thank you for um, joining, allowing me to join my esteemed colleagues on this panel. I wanna take a few minutes tonight to talk to you about what we're doing in heart failure treatment, recovery, um, and remission, which is a major focus of our program here. But before we start talking about um, recovery and remission, I think it's helpful to begin by talking about what heart failure is, because that's a question that many people have. Um, generally, when people receive that diagnosis, it's very daunting, and um, um, hearing about failure is not something that we want to hear about a central organ such as our heart. Well, actually, um, cardiac failure or heart failure could be better termed as insufficiency. So the heart is actually a pump and it has two phases. It has a phase where it relaxes and fills and a phase where it contracts and empties. And when it empties, that's how blood is circulated through the body. Now, heart failure can be caused by either a defect in the filling phase or in the contracting phase, and both result in less blood than is needed entering into the circulation. So heart failure or cardiac insufficiency can be caused by a heart that can't fill. And we call that diastolic dysfunction. And sometimes it can also be termed heart failure preserved ejection fraction or a heart that can't pump, um, which is characterized by systolic dysfunction or a heart that can pump effectively. Both conditions result in reduced blood flow being delivered to the organs of the body. And the way that the body responds to that insufficiency, which is part of where that term cardiac insufficiency comes from, is that there are hormonal changes and neurologic adaptations that start off um, in a way supporting the circulation, but over time lead to damage or reduced function of other organs, such as the brain, the kidneys, as well as the digestive system. The symptoms that are related to this are also associated with basically reduced function of the organs, as I've mentioned, and reduced ability to circulate um, blood and other fluids throughout the body. So patients will frequently have symptoms of congestion, um, which um, um, is consistent with difficulty breathing, 
um, fatigue and low energy from the reduced circulation throughout the body. People may experience swelling of the legs or hands and bloating in the body and poor concentration. So what do we do about them? So our first management um, approach in heart failure is pharmaceutical. So we have medications that have been developed over the last 30 years that have made a significant difference in terms of the survivability of, of heart failure and how long people survive, but also in symptom management. So 25, 30 years ago, it was very characteristic once when some, someone had a, a diagnosis of heart failure to be told that the mortality or the likelihood of dying was about 50% in five years. And that hasn't been true for quite a long time because with every new drug that's added that actually improves the quality of life and survival, there's a synergistic effect between these drugs such that with the current regimen, which includes four drugs, four um, classes of drugs, the RNAs or ARBs, the beta blockers, the MRA and the SGLT2 antagonists, there's about a 70% reduction in risk for mortality compared to patients who were being treated for heart failure 30 years ago. So what does that mean? What does that mean on average? So that means on average that we're seeing anywhere from a nine to 15 year increase in survival with heart failure based on the utilization of these drugs. Um, is this a one size fits all solution? Um, not quite, because uh, with all four of the drugs there um, become um, challenges with personalizing them to individual patients, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what are the other um, possibilities that we have for treatment beyond the medications? We also have device-based management. So cardiac resynchronization therapy is a therapy that has been along around for quite some time, which unfortunately, fortunately is very helpful for many people, but unfortunately isn't helpful for all people. And so in the last five to 10 years, we've had a number of other devices that have been added to our armamentarium, all of which are approved and available here at the University of Miami, which can help the heart to contract um, more efficiently so medic, uh, um, devices which are similar to pacemakers, which actually help the heart to contract more efficiently. There are devices that improve the neurologic um, component. I, as I mentioned a, a slide or two before, um, one of the things that happens is neuro, neurologic dysregulation. And we have a device that addresses that called the Barostim device. We also have devices that allow us to monitor patients who have heart failure in a non-invasive way that allows us to be able to predict when patients are becoming ill or at risk of becoming ill before they ever do so and address their medications beforehand and avoid um, the risk of hospitalization. Now, the most exciting thing about the last 10 years of therapy and heart failure and cardiac insufficiency, as it's also called, is that we've come to realize that whereas, again, 20 or 30 years ago, we thought that once people developed heart failure, it was basically associated with an inexorable decline and worsened and worsening function and decreased um, function of the heart and decreased function of the individual. And we really thought that the best that we could do therapeutically um, was to arrest the symptoms um, and maybe maybe um, prolong the life by, by a, a small amount with transplant at the time being the, the only cure. We now understand that many patients, actually more than we ever thought, are capable of having improved function of their own heart on the appropriate therapy and achieving what we like to call heart failure remission or is sometimes termed heart failure recovery. 
And in that um, scenario, patients will experience basically a return to a quality of life and a functional status similar to before they developed heart failure and also have similar changes, concomitant changes to their function on our um, devices and our measures of heart failure, heart function, such as echocardiogram. And that's actually what we're dedicated to at our Center for Heart Recovery and um, Therapeutic Innovation. We basically want to bring to bear essentially the latest and the greatest in terms of pharmaceutical interventions, as well as um, devices, the newest, most innovative devices that improve function and re promote reverse remodeling. So our approach is to use a multidisciplinary team. Um, we are using FDA um, evidence-based device and uh, FDA-based therapies. Um, we also are very active in clinical research and pharmaceutical tr trials, as well as novel device therapies. We collaborate closely with the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute, which is led by my colleague, Dr. Joshua Hare, to be able to, in a very personalized way, assess our patients who present with heart failure and understand which therapies are most likely to promote the best possible outcome for them based on how they develop heart failure and what their ongoing risk factors are and their other life and um, health risks. So with that, I'm going to wind up and say thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grisette. And uh, we can see from the audience's participation and uh, they're just, uh, into this tonight. Obviously, cardiovascular disease is of great interest. So let's move on to our next presenter, who is Dr. Carlos Alfonso, a board-certified interventional cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. His specialties include percutaneous coronary interventions, including complex coronary disease, structural heart disease, and transcatheter valve therapies, as well as peripheral and endovascular interventions. There you are, Dr. Alfonso. He beat me to the punch. <laughs> He's on screen. Go for it. We just need you to unmute. We see your presentation. One there little small little detail there. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Ileana. And thank you all for joining us tonight. It's great to be here with my colleagues um, to discuss uh, preventative cardiology, you know, and what we could do to prevent heart disease, um, you know, and heart failure is certainly the end stages of uh, coronary disease and heart disease. And so we, we uh, want to prevent that by all, you know, methods necessary. Um, so uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you what we do in terms of interventional cardiology and some of the, you know, complex uh, high risk uh, um, things we have um, and are able to do it for those patients that have progressive atherosclerosis. And none of this, you know, is done in uh, by, by ourselves. It's done as a part of a team. And we have one of the uh, world-class team over at the University of Miami U Health Towers. Uh, uh, the institution has really done a, an amazing job in uh, developing hybrid um, cath labs and uh, a cath lab team, which really is bar none, one of the best uh, cath lab teams uh, in the state, uh, I would say. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of that. You know, we work in a multidisciplinary fashion uh, with our colleagues um, in heart failure and electrophysiology and across all specialties, uh, really to deliver uh, some top-notch care. Uh, and it's really a great part to be uh, to, to be a part of this team and work together. So one of the areas that we focus on is really, you know, coronary disease and atherosclerosis. And unfortunately, to date, there's really no good way to reverse atherosclerosis. Um, um, presently available. Um, the, the statins are great at uh, halting progression and the PCSK9 inhibitors are good uh, additions to our armamentarium, uh, but there's really no good data that this reverses the process. And so at times we're left with patients that have advanced uh, coronary disease um, and we have to uh, uh, have alternatives to treat our patients. And so um, you know, coronary intervention and um, via catheterization is one of those tools uh, that we're uh, specialized in. And uh, we, in particular, are specialized in de delivering high-end um, uh, complex procedures for patients that have um, 
little alternatives. Um, these are oftentimes patients that have been told they're too high risk for surgery or have already undergone surgery uh, and need further uh, interventions. Um, Dr. Grisette uh, highlighted uh, some of the advances in um, our heart armamentarium uh, in, over the past uh, decade or two has really been the development of devices that help us uh, treat uh, patients. And we have temporary devices and uh, mechanical support devices, which are pumps which support the heart and allow us to uh, perform some of these complex interventions on chronically occluded vessels um, to get them open, get patients feeling better, prevent angina, symptoms, heart failure, uh, and hopefully prevent future events uh, for the future. Um, so this is one of the things that we're doing at the university. I'm actually uh, also very excited about some of the new things that we're developing and some of the new programs. And so I'd like to highlight a couple of these new programs where we're actually first in Miami-Dade County uh, to be able to offer to our patients. Um, and one of those is the uh, uh, ability to evaluate coronary disease non-invasively with CT scans. Now, we, we use CT scans to look at the coronaries and to look for calcium, and we'll talk a little bit about calcium scoring and what the role of calcium scoring is uh, a little bit later throughout the talk. Um, but we could also look at the flow in the arteries with a little bit more advanced techniques, and that's, that's something that's developed uh, to really decide which patients need to go to the cath lab uh, and which patients perhaps could be treated with medications from a preventative therapy standpoint uh, with statins and other medications to slow the progression of disease, um, as, as we discussed. Uh, we're, we also have tools in the cath lab, um, um, and we're the first to, uh, to be able to offer uh, the evaluation of microvascular disease uh, in the Miami-Dade County area. Um, and these are uh, specialized wires which could best uh, evaluate the microvascular flow. And this is important because there's many patients, uh, women in particular, uh, who come to the cath lab with anginal symptoms, and these are your typical symptoms. Um, you know, uh, everybody manifests them differently, uh, but we know that some patients have angina and have abnormal stress studies, uh, but have had catheterizations, which tell them uh, tell us that they don't have coronary disease. Well, what we do know now is that 50% of these patients that have been told they don't have obstructive epicardial coronary disease in the major vessels may actually have what we call as microvascular disease uh, in the small vessels. And this uh, disproportionately affects women. Um, and so uh, certainly we could evaluate that further now, but with these tools to really be able to um, uh, dial down on what is causing our patient's symptoms and uh, give them appropriate therapy. So I think we have uh, two new tools that we'll be uh, pioneering in the South Florida area to look at non-invasive assessment of coronary disease as well as microvascular disease. Now, you know, one of the big uh, innovative things that's, that's happened in, uh, structural, in interventional and structural cardi cardiology over the past decade is the evolution of transcatheter valve therapies for heart disease. And, you know, we were part of uh, the pioneering this in the state of Florida, actually the first uh, hospital in the state of Florida to do transcatheter valve replacement and, and remain on the forefront of these technology. Um, and, you know, we're happy to be a part of this. And this is a, a tool uh, to treat uh, aortic valve disease um, non-invasively via transcatheter valve approach. Now our surgeons, Dr. Lamellis, are uh, perhaps world renowned and world experts at doing minimally invasive surgeries, but this uh, gives an option to patients that can't have surgery or are at higher risk of surgical um, complications. And so this is really a uh, part of our armamentarium nowadays, and it's great to be a part of our structural heart uh, program. But it's not limited to the aortic valve currently. And we now have therapies for all four valves. Uh, there are uh, therapies for the mitral valve to treat mitral insufficiency, which is a leaky mitral valve. Uh, this is what we're seeing in the video here. Uh, it's a clip essentially that goes onto the mitral valve and brings both leaflets together to minimize the amount of uh, regurgitation and leakage in the mitral valve. Um, there are therapies uh, now uh, FDA approved to treat the valves with valve replacement. So for failing uh, mitral valves, we could do cert, uh, minimally invasive uh, replacement of, of the valves. And there are some other tools uh, being um, in studies currently to treat the tricuspid valve um, and other, uh, other um, structural issues. Um, and so it's exciting to be a part of these innovative techniques and innovative programs. Um, so re really, interventional cardiology at the University of Miami is really offering the full spectrum of services for both diagnosis and treatment of coronary as well as structural heart disease, including valvular heart disease. Uh, we also have programs uh, um, in combination with our colleagues in, intro in electrophysiology, Dr. Mitrani and Dr. Goldberger, looking at the transcatheter closure of the left atrial appendage for patients that are at high risk of stroke, but also at high risk of bleeding to prevent 
uh, and be able to stop their anticoagulants. Uh, we have, uh, have programs in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, with some of our colleagues in adult congenital. And uh, as Dr. Grisette mentioned, uh, we have uh, evolving treatments for uh, device-based therapies for heart failure. So in the last 30 seconds, I also want to highlight, you know, what's a passion for all of us, you know, being here at the university is, you know, the training of the next generation of specialists in cardiology and training our fellows, you know, and through the University of Miami and Jackson, we are part of the, you know, the training of the next generation of cardiovascular specialists that are going to be taking care of our patients out in the community. And that's really something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Alfonso. And that's why we're moving this along. And uh, last but not least, our final speaker is Dr. Yanis Hadizisis, Professor of Cardiology and Chief of the Cardiovascular Division at the Miller School of Medicine. He has received more than 40 international and national awards and mentored many general cardiology, interventional cardiology, imaging, and research fellows and faculty who are now faculty or trainees in renowned institutions in the US and Europe. We welcome you tonight, Dr. Hadizisis. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Ileana. I'm uh, so humbled to be part of this uh, amazing uh, um, session, electronic session tonight. Um, in my capacity as uh, a leader of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, the Miller School of Medicine, uh, I would like to spend the next few minutes here to show you how we can make the difference. Um, the uh, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine is uh, uniquely positioned in the ecosystem of uh, the Miller School of Medicine and the UHealth. What are the strengths of this ecosystem? We have visionary leadership at the health system level and the uh, medical school level. We have skillful faculty and staff, some of whom you already see tonight in this session. We have world-class centers and institutes. We have extensive clinical and research infrastructure, and we have a premier academic ecosystem. What is our clinical focus? As shown here, we focus on prevention, which is key to prevent you know, future disease. We focus on hyperlipidemia, on hypertension, special emphasis on women's health, we focus on coronary artery disease all the way from prevention to diagnosis with novel diagnostic methods and therapies, including advanced therapies of complex disease. We focus on valvular and structural heart disease using minimally invasive therapies, either percutaneous or surgical. We use the latest techniques to tackle problems related to valves. We focus on advanced heart failure as Dr. Gazette showed you earlier, using latest medical therapies, mechanical support, and access to cardiac transplantation. We focus on electrophysiology. We have pioneers in the field. We apply advanced therapies for AFib and other arrhythmias, including complex ones, using the latest techniques. And of course, we focus through our collaboration with our vascular surgeons and cardiothoracic surgeons. We focus on the aortic and peripheral artery disease. And we operate as division, as a, a, a system in a wild healthcare environment, a wild healthcare system. We have the tower, the U Health Tower, which is located in downtown. And then around this central point, we have multiple satellite medical centers, which, like a spider, cover and offer care to the entire area, metropolitan area of Miami, Lenar, Boca, Plantation, West Palm Beach, Kendall, Deerfield, Fort Lauderdale, and soon to open Solimia, a beautiful contemporary state-of-the-art medical center that opens in 2025, and another new, brand new medical center in Doral that opens in 2024. So with this decentralized if you want, healthcare system, we bring the cardiovascular experts in your neighborhood. Now, this is our foundation, this is our present, and we built on this present, on these strengths, 
to plan our future. What is our mission? Number one, to offer the finest clinical care. Number two, to undertake world-class research and bring innovation. Number three, to provide top-class, excellent education and training. Number four, to integrate digital technologies in our operations. And number five, to collaborate with academia and industry. Let me walk you through uh, each one of these strategic pillars. At the clinical care level, we have, this is the top five priorities for us. Build new programs, all the way from prevention, to diagnosis and therapy of cardiovascular disease. Offer good quality and achieve excellent outcomes. Bring innovation, reputation, and increase our clinical volumes. These are the top five priorities for us. When it comes to research and innovation, we perform world-class, multidisciplinary, I want to emphasize this, research specialized on heart conditions, heart and vascular conditions. You see here, we collaborate medicine, engineering, biology as a well-oiled machine. And our research portfolio extends all the way from basic science to preclinical animal studies to clinical studies, aiming to find answers related to pathophysiology, diagnosis, and therapy of cardiovascular disease. Education and training, equally important. We train the next generation of cardiovascular clinicians, researchers, innovators, and leaders. We are gradually becoming pioneers in using digital health, digital technologies in education and training to help our trainees learn greater, faster, and better. Equally important, integration of digital health. We envision to evolve into a technological hub of innovation and excellence. In the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, we will prioritize the use of artificial intelligence, simulations, extended reality, personalized medicine in prevention, diagnosis, and therapy of cardiovascular disease. And last but not least, we prioritize collaborations with academia and industry. We build robust networks of excellence with academic institutes in the US and abroad. We build collaborations with industry and FDA. And we envision to evolve into a world-class center for cardiovascular device research and development. So with, uh, in a nutshell, we are here to change the game. We're here to build an academically competitive division of cardiovascular medicine that can make the difference and stand out at the state, national, and international level. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hadizis. And you, you make a, this, a very strong point tonight, and that is that this is an academic center of excellence. You know, there are others uh, that don't have that behind their name. So let's launch into the questions because I can tell that our audience is paying attention. We're going to take the first one to Dr. Oranger because they listened to the um, presentation. And here's the question. Can you tell us the difference between results from a calcium score and the MRI that discovered the calcium deposits that you discovered, um, that were discovered during the study you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? Can you address that? Yeah, so one of the key things to remember today is that it used to be that you'd go to, to, a, to a cardiologist and you wanted to know if you were at risk for heart disease and the cardiologist would say, I'll tell you what, let's do a stress test. And then some people got into the mode of doing annual stress tests to make sure that they weren't developing disease. But in fact, we know that by the time a stress test becomes abnormal, the disease is far advanced. And we now have ways that we can determine much earlier whether a person is at risk. And one of the ways to do that is inappropriate individuals, that is men 40 or, or older or women 50 or older, who may have a couple of one or, or more risk factors for heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, family histories. We can do what's called a coronary calcium score, which is a test that takes about five to 10 minutes. There is no IV uh, involved. It simply is a very rapid CT scan looking at 
the presence of calcium in the walls that supply the heart, uh, heart's blood supply, basically. And those people who have calcium in the artery walls supplying the heart are at increased risk for future heart attacks. The more of it you have, the greater is your risk. And so by determining whether a person has calcium and how much calcium they have in the artery walls, we can tailor preventive therapies to exactly how much risk they have, making sure that they are appropriately treated, not undertreated or overtreated. It's interesting that many people who have several risk factors for heart disease turn out not to have any coronary calcium at all. And some who have just a little bit turn out to have severe coronary calcium. So it's the way of amalgamating all your risk factors to look at whether whatever the, the uh, environment is in your body, whether you've developed this disease. And the beauty of it is, is that this is a test that we can use to help to tailor our treatment to the individual. And I do know that uh, the university right now is offering for the month of February, $25 uh, calcium screenings. Uh, so you can ask more information about that, but you can find out by going to umiamihealth.org slash heart screening and get that for $25. But Dr. Oranger, uh, a lot of people ask, is it always indicative that either you're going to have cardiovascular disease or that you're home free? If you have a zero score, does that mean you're, you're okay and you can live however you want and do whatever you want? Well, the, actually the importance of the score not only depends upon the amount of calcium you have, but the amount of calcium you have at a given age. For example, if a person has just a little bit of calcium and they're 40 or 45 years away of age, they're in trouble because they shouldn't have any at that age. On the other hand, if you're 70 years of age and have a little bit of calcium or no calcium, your risk is extremely low going forward. So it's an interpretation, not only of how much calcium you have, but the age at which you have it, uh, that, that helps us to make that determination. But even for people who have calcium scores of zero, uh, in many cases, even, especially in, the, in younger individuals, we will recommend a repeat study in about five years because over time, some people develop coronary calcium, which means that once again, treatments that, that will help with prevention would be indicated. Yeah. Dr. Alfonso, I know that you direct uh, answered uh, somebody who was asking about the baby aspirin. So let's put the baby aspirin discussion out there because everybody says, should I be on it? Should I not be on it? Who should be on it? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so the way we look at aspirin or an, any antiplatelet therapies, whether we're targeting primary prevention, which means somebody who's never had a heart attack or never had a stroke or an atherosclerotic event versus secondary prevention. And there's a lot of talk in the media about you know, there's no benefit for aspirin therapy across the board. But what that's really referring to is primary therapy, primary prevention. So patients that have had a stroke or have had a heart attack, there is a benefit for antiplatelet therapy at minimum aspirin or other therapies. And that's something that they should really talk to their physicians and cardiologists about personalizing in their case. Now for primary preventive therapy, there, there is some, the, the main concern is that there is a risk that comes with aspirin and that risk is, is bleeding risk. And so, um, you know, we want to uh, mitigate the bleeding risk as much as possible while maximizing the benefit. Um, and one of the ways we could do that and that we're learning is it precisely what we've been talking about is the calcium score. Um, so for patients that have never had a heart attack, the calcium score may help further um, differentiate those that are very low risk perhaps who would not benefit from an aspirin versus those who do have a, a benefit for primary prevention uh, on top of their other risk factors. And so, so I think that it, it is a very useful tool um, in, in, in many regards in terms of uh, you know, assessing the burden of atherosclerosis and to decide whether patients would benefit from aspirin therapy. This is a great question that I think any of you can address. Uh, perhaps Dr. Grisett can take this one um, or Dr. Hadizizis. Is there any focus in participating in patient heart health care from early ages? Let's say when we can really nip it in the bud and make a difference at 40 or, or even before then. Um, I guess this uh, is a very a interesting and very um, important question. And this is also connected to another question from the audience, at what uh, age we should start preventive cardiology? Mm -hmm. Plus, if preventive cardiology is intended only for people with cardiac disease, with heart conditions. So the short answer here and clear answer is that preventive cardiology is intended for those who do not have heart disease primarily. 
because as the word says, we offer preventive cardiology to prevent heart conditions. Once we have, we develop heart disease, obviously we keep going with prevention. It's like an ongoing process, but most of the benefit comes from early stages before we develop any heart disease. Prevention is preferable to cure. That's uh, something which should be uh, 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 totally uh, kind of like, uh, it's written on the stone if you want, and we should really follow this. And I want to highlight that in our preventive cardiology center, we are going in the next few months to launch a campaign. And the campaign is that every male older than 40 and every female older than 50 in the metropolitan area of Miami should have a checkup in the preventive cardiology center of the University of Miami, the only comprehensive and academic uh, preventive center, cardiology center in the, in the area. Let's discuss statins. I see a lot of the questions coming in from people who are on them or they're even on, on uh, blood thinners and things like that. What's the, when is the use of statin appropriate and when is it not? Maybe too many people are on them? Anyone wanna take that one? I'll be happy to tackle that one. Uh, People uh, today have, have great opportunity for prevention uh, with the use of statins. Now the question is which people should benefit from statins? And what we've determined today is those people who have a greater burden of risk factors, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, family history of early heart disease, those are the ones who tend, particularly in their middle years, to be in a position where they will benefit from statins. But again, coming back to the coronary calcium score, it has been determined that even people who are in their middle years who have multiple risk factors for heart disease, about half of them turn out to have no coronary calcium and actually do not benefit from being on statins. They benefit from good dietary approaches and good exercise. So in fact, and once again, the use of coronary calcium helps you to personalize treatment in those individuals and to determine who is likely to benefit from being on a statin and who is not. But those individuals who have strong burdens of family history of heart disease, uh, who have uh, uh, some optimally controlled high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, smokers, those people, you don't need a calcium score to know that they will need and will benefit from a statin. Now, a small percentage of people actually will get certain side effects from statins, the most common of which are muscle aches. Um, uh, and there's a very small increased risk for the development of diabetes in people with statins. But in fact, uh, the muscle symptoms can be very readily handled in the vast majority of cases by experts who know how to deal with this problem. And, and, um, and as far as, uh, as, far as uh, all other issues that, re that the diabetes issue, the only people who ever develop diabetes after taking statins are those who are pre-diabetic to begin with, strong family histories of diabetes, carrying a lot of extra weight, those individuals who, who are almost on the edge of, of developing diabetes will develop it. But even if they develop diabetes while taking a statin, the treatment of choice is a statin because statins reduce heart attack and stroke risk. So statins are extraordinarily uh, helpful and, uh, and people should not be afraid of them because we have, we have multiple statins, very inexpensive and have great potential to stop the progression of coronary artery disease. I'm glad you address that because again, you always hear this, well, the muscle aches and the, and the joints and so forth, but uh, there, there's a, a life-saving component. Um, I, I ask all of our presenters just in, in between when we're talking, try and mute because sometimes it interferes with, with um, the whole thing. Um, let's talk about women. Okay, so it's always been that heart disease was predominantly a male disease, but now we're seeing that more women, and I think it was Dr. Alfonso who just presented that women are now presenting with more microvascular disease, hormone-based, I'm assuming. Can we discuss men and women with heart disease? Well, so I, I could discuss a little bit you know, in terms of microvascular disease. Well, we, we know that women, you know, uh, tend to have more microvascular disease, um, uh, and the, the presentation uh, oftentimes may be may be different um, in terms of the anginal symptoms or whether anginal symptoms are. Uh, and I bring that up because we don't want to discount, you know, some of the symptoms, you know, and um, you know, shushu the symptoms because they may present differently. 
um, uh, and, and men and women. And that's something that we're, that's been highlighted uh, even in the most recent uh, chest pain guidelines uh, where we no longer describe chest pain as atypical because th those may be typical symptoms for, for that patient. And so uh, I think that uh, there's more and more understanding of the, you know, that, that symptoms present uh, differently in different people um, that we need to be, uh, listen to our patients and really kind of de develop a treatment plan together. And we have tools to do that now. And that's what's exciting. In the past, uh, you know, we didn't have the tools to really uh, uh, dial down and, and, and assess these uh, microvascular uh, disease. And we used to call it what syndrome X, the unknown, the black box. But now we have tools to evaluate that and uh, develop treatment plans. So that's what's exciting to us. Very. And Dr. Hadizizis, I think you were referring to the fact that we have this now launching a comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, program prevention and so forth. So here's a question, uh, a person who's asking to participate in the center, is this typically covered by insurance? How does one enroll? Uh, yes, I would say Dr. Origin, who is the, the head of this uh, effort of the center, uh, will be more suitable to, to provide this answer. You're mute. mute yourself, Dr. Oranger. Sorry, it's my fault. I told everyone to mute. <laughs> so, so right now, uh, regardless of the fact that the formal opening of the center has not yet occurred, and it will be shortly, the fact of the matter is that the insurance uh, issue depends upon when you come to see a, any clinician at the University of Miami, uh, insurance coverage is the same. So if you're coming in for prevention, there is a, a clear mandate that, that you have reason to do so. Uh, you may have a family history, you may have multiple risk factors. Those are all part of what insurance traditionally covers. So there's no reason to think that these services would not be covered in, uh, prior to the formal opening of our prevention center. Good to know. And, and of course, good to address because it's it's a question that's always on people's minds with coverage. Um, now here's, we, we had to go there. Here's a question on COVID and heart disease. Is there a proven correlation? We know COVID was a vascular attack on the system. So has there and been anything, any research and studies that have proven a correlation between heart issues and COVID? Certainly, I can take that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, certainly um, we've seen in patients with acute COVID um, syndrome that we saw an uh, incidence, we have saw incidence of myocarditis, which is basically an inflammatory reaction that happens in the heart. We also know that in a small number of people after COVID, um, there's a tendency to have fast heartbeats, tachyarrhythmias. Um, we've also seen in even a smaller group of people, um, symptoms associated with what's been called long COVID, where they may have palpitations and, and also mild cardio, cardiac dysfunction, not necessarily heart failure, but um, dysfunction of the heart, um, which seems thankfully to be transient in the sense that we see a bump in it in the months immediately after COVID for some people, but over time, um, the symptoms and the, the, the functional abnormalities seem to recede. Great. Um, Dr. Alfonso had said earlier, atherosclerosis, um, is it reversible? Um, and a lot of people are concerned and asking if I'm sick, I'm sick, that's it. Um, we, we know that there are a, a lot of new drugs and, and new regimens that, that go specifically to plaque and, and all of this. Can we discuss that a little? Dr. Alfonso, you're yeah. muted. Okay. Yeah. Well, so yeah, so um, I think there was a question in the chat earlier in terms of what can we do to reverse atherosclerosis? And well, there are some small catheter-based studies looking at ultrasound in the vessels that suggest we could regress maybe by 5 to 10% with some of the newer agents and PCSK9 inhibitors. There's no large studies to suggest that we really regress atherosclerosis. Um, um, but we certainly, you know, the key thing is to keep progression from happening and keep it from getting worse, you know. Um, and so certainly there's um, the best tools we have, you know, in terms of medications uh, currently are the statins, you know, in certain patients, uh, you know, PCSK9 inhibitors and other newer therapies, you know, um, you know, um, for example, Vasipa and others, you know, may be useful in addition to statin therapy to help uh, and slow down the progression. 
and also to stabilize the plaque. Because one thing is progression, which is a slow progression. You know, another thing is uh, acute plaque rupture uh, and atherosclerosis and inflammation, which is what leads to a heart attack. And so statins are helpful uh, in both regards, you know, uh, slowing the progression and also stabilizing the plaque to prevent um, a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, and, and is, I'm sorry, let me add here, a stat mm -hmm. statins uh, uh, on top of lifestyle uh, changes, exercise, uh, weight control, healthy diet, low fat, low sugar diet, and uh, at the same time, um, um, it, it, to, to, we need to make sure that we control uh, risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and so on. So risk factor management, lifestyle changes, and then medications, all three can help us, uh, if not um, uh, kind of like slow down the atherosclerosis, uh, 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 so if not reverse atherosclerosis, at least slow down atherosclerosis. Yeah, and I, one thing that I wanted to say about that too is that uh, we are now able uh, much more than we've ever been in the past to literally stop cold the progression of atherosclerosis. So when we talk about the use of very aggressive LDL cholesterol lowering strategies, uh, very good blood pressure control uh, in, in patients with established disease, the use of antiplatelet agents like aspirin, uh, uh, and, and then other uh, treatments that we have, uh, the fact that a person has plaque doesn't necessarily mean that they're ever going to get another event. So it's very important to point out that that this is probably the most optimistic that I've ever felt about uh, prevention of progression of this disease. And so people who come in, even with advanced disease, that disease can be put into a very quiescent state as long as they do all the right things to take care of themselves and to follow the medical treatments we recommend. The 21st century has been very good for cardiovascular care and advances. Um, we're winding down. So if I, you've all been incredible as presenters and, and the information you've disseminated and, and shared with the audience tonight is invaluable. If you could just give us a quick wrap up, a minute, just go around the room and give us a final take home message before I, we say goodnight to this great interactive audience. Go ahead, Dr. Oranger, if you wanna start at the top and take it from there, each one. Well, what a privilege it's been to be with, with uh, my colleagues and and our new uh, head, uh, Giannis, is a wonderful man with a great vision for what's going on in the future. And with the colleagues like you saw here tonight, you can uh, get excited about all the fine treatments that are available to you at the University of Miami. Next, Dr. Grisette, Dr. Alfonso, Dr. Hadizizis. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This has been a, a great, crowd and we've had some great questions in the chat. I think that we've had really exciting advances at the University of Miami and we expect that we're going to see even more sort of we have more firsts here first in Miami-Dade County first in Florida than I think you'll find at any other institution. Um, we're developing um, new approaches to diseases, common diseases, rare diseases every day I, I think that you will be benefited by coming and seeing a clinician here, and we would love to, to welcome you to our programs and our clinics. As so, everyone see on the screen, you, you have the contact information right there in front of you for appointments and so forth. Go ahead, Dr. Alfonso, sorry. Great. So while, while we're focused on prevention and preventing heart disease and preventing heart failure for the future, there are some therapies and it's a, you know, I wanted to highlight some of the therapies that we have available for those that unfortunately develop heart disease. And hopefully we were able to provide you some solutions, uh, you know, for those uh, that, that may require and to be aware of some of the therapies uh, and innovative therapies that we're developing for the future. And final word from you, Dr. Hadizis. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, as, as you can tell, we approach heart disease, heart and vascular disease globally, holistically. Um, we go all the way from prevention to diagnosis and therapy. And in the University of Miami, we have the infrastructure, the healthcare system, we have the know-how, we have the experts, and we have the research, and all together make us unique, uh, make us uh, destined to, um, to, to be impactful and change the game. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for, uh, we have like a big audience here, I see like uh, more than uh, 150, 160 people at some point, 
and um, uh, this is very telling. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to uh, our colleagues tonight, our experts, world class experts who joined this uh, um, this session. And of course, a big thank you, Iliana, to you uh, for coordinating this discussion so seamlessly. And of course, to our uh, uh, marketing and development uh, um, uh, groups who have uh, uh, worked on the background uh, effortlessly, effortlessly to put this together. Thank you so very much. That's very, very kind uh, of you to share with all of us. And uh, we thank you, our audience tonight, our experts uh, for the generosity of your time. And we invite all of you to learn more about the University of Miami Health System and the academic-based cardiac and vascular program. You had the information on your screen, the phone number, uhealthcv.com. And please don't forget to fill out the survey at the end. Give us some feedback on your experience, maybe even future topics. Good night to our experts, all of you, and to you, a great night and stay well and healthy. Good night. Bye-bye.